All right, so I might start my screen share. Um, all right, so everybody can still see that, looks good. Um, okay. Um, all right, so um, I, yeah, like Carla, Carla did a nice job of filling in most of the, the background. Um, I grew up in Australia, um, went back to London for school. Um, and when I was in art school, I studied photography and this was, I graduated my undergrad in 2001 before they really even had a decent digital media department at Goldsmith. Now there's a really great one. Um, so I then hit a point though, when the camera felt very limiting to me. And in particular, the, I was also dealing with chronic illness at the time and disability. And I'd been doing this very physically intensive photography practice where I was going out on the street and logging my large camera. Um, and I kind of needed to physically and mentally pivot and find something, something else. So I enrolled at RMIT University and I started working with this device in the, um, which I might show you the video in just a, a moment. I've got imagery. Yeah. So at RMIT, they were using 3D scanners and 3D printers to rebuild Gaudi's famously unfinished Sagrada Familia Cathedral. And they were actually 3D scanning his maquettes to get data to find out how he had envisioned the, this unfinished building. And so I started kind of using the scanner after hours when it was not in Barcelona, coming into the lab and scanning myself. And right away, the, there was a real resonance for me with taking a scientific tool and applying it to the human body, um, an architectural tool and applying it to the human body, which was really interesting. So this is a short clip that just shows the way that a particular scanner that I use works. And forgive me if some of you have already used laser scanners and know how they work. Um, it's, there's a beam of light. It captures the subject's face with the video camera in the handset and the beam changes as it moves over the curvature of the form and the software reconstructs that data uh, in the program. And it's very intimate, very close and personal and you're really, it's a very one-to-one -one transaction. It almost feels like making a kind of Victorian portrait. You know, they have to hold really still and their eyes are closed. And there's, it did not feel like a um, digital kind of transaction at all. Um, I'm gonna interrupt you for a oh, second because I just saw something in the chat. Oh yeah. That yeah. says that someone is not seeing anything. Are you all oh, really? seeing the video? I don't. Oh, yeah, everyone else can see. I can all see it. Okay, you don't need me to change anything? No, we have one person with an issue. I don't know why that is, but I don't, yeah, I think, I think it might be on, on his end. On their end. They're not seeing the speaker notes, are they? Because of the dual monitor. No. no, no. Okay. <laughs> Nobody's seeing speaker notes, right? If you are letting us. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I hope they're able to uh, to sort it out. Um, okay. And so this is a, a later performance where I also use the scanner. Um, I can come back to this actually and show you a little more documentation, but. I really only ever scan the body and it was always the human body that was the most resonant for me. The, oh, actually here, I can show this too. Um, and I'm still using the same scanner that they were using at RMIT in 2003. So it's not by any means the hottest and newest device. I think they've probably improved drastically since I started, but I became very, very attached to all the little idiosyncrasies and quirks and in particular, the way that this scanner really failed to capture the body. And that's something that I just kind of kept coming back to over the course of my work. So this was actually one of the first scans of my face that I ever did when I was kind of 23 years old. And the thing that struck me about it right away was its resemblance to a death mask. And I've talked a lot in different talks. This is something Carla might have talked about briefly too when kind of introducing my work about 
the the linkage between death and technology. And I once had a professor, actually again an architecture professor that I was working with in grad school, who um, was from a, an older generation, and he said to me once, "I whenever my students 3D model something, it just there's something about it to me. It comes out looking like a block of ice." And funnily enough, I actually wasn't offended by this as a digital artist. You know, I kind of agree with him. Um, this this scanner in particular, there's no skin tone. The skin it comes up in this weird default white, which is problematic, and I'm going to talk about that later too. Um, and then the closed eyes, it, it really looked just like a death mask. And there was this incredibly eerie feeling to it and a sense that life was really not being translated, that it failed to capture human life. And so instead of trying to eradicate that, that I decided that was something that I was going to try and tease out. And I was going to think about the emotional quality of this digital image. So after I left RMIT for actually quite a long time, I was making these 2D prints and these are large. They're installed in darkened galleries. They have this, um, what I was really looking at was Victorian spirit photography, which if people are, people are probably familiar with those, that imagery, it's sort of frightening, but also really ridiculous at the same time and slightly kind of hysterical and clearly fake. Um, but some of the images, if they get it just right, have a real eeriness to them. So um, I was reading about ectoplasm and mediums and spirituality. And the I had these digital bodies that were very fragmented and damaged. And, but I, I really, my heart was with making sculpture. And back in 2005, um, I wasn't a, a tinkerer and, or a hacker really. I'm not an engineer and I'm not somebody who has the time or the bandwidth, unfortunately, to make the tools to make my work, um, along with making the work. And I have tremendous respect for people who are tool makers as well as artists, and it was just never my forte. So I was really limited. I wanted to make 3D printed sculpture. And at the first piece that I made, I, you know, I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on a wax stereolithograph because that was what we could make at the time, and then took that to a foundry and then couldn't make anything else for years. So it was really what changed for me was when much more user-friendly software and um, service bureaus like Shapeways came on the scene. So by 2011, and that's quite a long time um, from when I first started using these tools, I was actually able to realize the sculpture. I was actually able to edit it myself in the software and have full control over the quality of the form. And that was really, really exciting. So I started grad school around that time at SCIC. And at that point, I was pretty well versed in software. So I came in into the art and technology department, but I actually spent almost all my time in sculpture and ceramics. And I taught, my, well, taught myself, I learned how to make molds. I learned casting, foundry. Um, I would make these silicone molds from the 3D print of the 3D scan. So always with me it's a stupid convoluted workflow um, that I, I have to put up with um, but it was really interesting too for me that these these objects came through a digital journey you know they they, they started off as a live breathing human model they are digitized that's imperfect there are errors in translation that happen from the digitization um, things like you know, the, the darkness over her eyes, she was wearing really dark eyeliner and dark eyeshadow and my scanner couldn't see that. There's a gap behind her nose on her face because if you imagine, if I were to look at you in profile like this, there's a gap, your eye doesn't see that area behind the nose. Um, then when it's cast in wax, there's more errors that come there. There's drips, there's scratches, um, the bronze further, things go wrong. And so when it comes back into the physical world, it's completely altered from the form that it, it had been um, and almost unrecognizable really. So it felt to me like this kind of relic, you know, this idea of like a future relic, something that archeologists may have unearthed. Um, I really loved always that materiality was really important. So, and similar with this one, there's this funny pattern of circuitry that you can see really finely over the models sort of across here, across her chest, across her nose. And that's actually the build lines from the 3D printer 
And many artists will try and hide that, sand it away, prime it. And I had the opposite reaction. I, I rubbed pigment into it at the foundry and had it burnished so you could really, really see all the digital artifacting. Um, these fragmented layers also happen because she moves and shifts around a little bit in space, just like that as I sweep the scan moves and shifts again. And so um, they just, I don't align them. I sort of let it be raw and um, it's, it's semi-generative. Um, I really wanted to make large sculpture. That's actually always been my goal. And after I made a long series of these heads, I started looking at cemetery sculpture and funereal kind of monuments and particularly the ways that the female body was represented and sexuality was represented in these contexts because you have this really strange phenomenon where um, the gravestones of a, a real supposedly you know respectable woman were very chaste and demure and she's got her cross and she's fully clothed and very peaceful um, and then these the monuments that are supposedly grief or you know um, a kind of archetype a female archetype really really racy um, in a religious cemetery there are these nude women in these attitudes of kind of sleep ecstasy dream delirium um, and that again that that image became a really recurrent one in my work thinking about what it means to create a memorial um, and thinking about what it means to create a monument but a monument to an, an individual body um, I started looking at other kind of references too so I'm sure you've all Everybody I'm sure knows this one, the Uncanny Valley. Um, for me, it, it was echoing that thing that my professor had said in grad school about things turning out like a block of ice, like the closer that we get to being able to replicate the human, perfect human likeness, the more repellent the results become, like the eerier and more haunted looking they become. Um, and so, you know, there's a reason that the animation studios don't really aim for photorealism anymore and it's all Pixar cartoons and kind of stylized creatures um, because it, there's something about it that's really viscerally upsetting. It's kind of like Freudian unheimlich, you know, quality. Um, my all time favorite reference is um, Star Trek matter transporter accident scene, where, <laughs> which is the idea of somebody being teleported, created into digital space. They're mangled, they come back wrong. And when they try to reconstruct them in the flesh, there's, you know, something, something very bad happens. I think that was a really apt metaphor for a lot of what I'm doing in my work. Um, so my graduate show at SCIC was... Oh, Sophie, I'm going to interrupt once again. Oh, I'm so yeah, sure. sorry. We do have one person who's still not seeing your slides. I was wondering if maybe we could try to... Should I stop redo the share, again? The share screen? Yeah, yeah that's the only I can try that again. to do because I don't think there's anything I can do in my end. No. Um, yeah, if you can try to do... Let, Let me screen share one. again. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, maybe, do you want me to? Just, I mean, that person's viewing it in a browser, so it may just be oh, a thing yeah. that's not, it, that's beyond both of our controls, but yeah, we'll at least try. Um, th thank you. Can everybody, can, can that person see this now? Is If they want to chime in, let me know if they're able to see it this time. Sorry, when I'm sharing, I can't see the chat, I don't think. I don't, yeah, and I got a private chat. Uh, um, I think that's all we can do, so let's. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I know it'll be recorded, right? So we can. Uh, oh, yeah. That along. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah. carry on, please. Yeah, no, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so yeah, so my, my solo show at the end of my MFA, I, these are all, sculptures that were created from scans of my own body over over the years and I actually worked with the museum mount maker from the art institute who'd worked on the greek and roman galleries at the art institute and we kind of tried to recreate that same ambiance there um the excuse me one moment I'm going to ask my uh, my daughter to be a little quieter um Eva sweetheart Eva Eva it's too loud okay mommy's doing a lecture thank you so much I'm sorry, everybody. Um, so we had this very somber lighting. We copied the paint chip color from the galleries. And we also tried to suggest the 
being this idea of being inside a Maya render. So it was kind of a digital simulation of a fragmented classical artifact. And um, the from a, from the start, from the outside, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna um, just uh, make sure that there's, there's no more background noise, excuse me. For. Okay, it looks like the person who wasn't able to see has it sorted out. So we'll jump back on. Oh my goodness, I can't even- No worries, don't 20, worry. 2021. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Um, Anyway, sorry everybody. So yeah. I will I will come back to uh, here. Where were we? Um, let me see. Actually, am I am I still sharing? No, let me start. This. No, start the sharing. Okay. Okay. From current. Slide. And really, don't worry about the the sound. It's not very. Well, um, she will get noisier and noisier watching YouTube. Okay. So it's uh, it's. <laughs> Establishing, you know. <laughs> well, it's adorable. We had time. Thank adorable. you, thank you. Remote kindergarten just shouldn't be a thing. Um, okay, so the Greek and Roman galleries. Um, they uh, and the idea was that from a distance it looked like a kind of fragmented classical marble, but then when you got up close, it was very clearly um, a fake. And you could see that these were actually plastic objects and they were copies. And I was also, you know, I was thinking a lot about like forgery. I was thinking about ownership of, of um, objects in museums, but that was really my last work, my last engagement with, with the classical. And I very much kind of tried to move away from that since. This was one of the last pieces that I did in that death, death, death mask series. And this is a triple exposure. So I had scanned the model's face I'd had her turn, actually it was her idea to turn, scanned her again, then she turned another time and scanned again. And so it was almost a new descending a staircase kind of cubist accumulation of time in this one image. And then I added this weird digital decay, this fungus that goes across her eyes and her nose that comes from my software trying to resolve information that is just fundamentally unresolvable, that doesn't obey the laws of physics. So that, that was kind of the tail end to that series. So moving on, um, I, I've always had a kind of strong research element in my practice as well. And I started considering, well, I started thinking about hysteria, which is, again, it interested me coming from my own history of, of illness and a history of disability um, and an interest in the female body and medicine and how that that has been treated or not treated over the years and again probably a term that most people are familiar with it's now completely discounted you would not find it in you know the dsm four or five but a hundred some years ago many 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 thousands of women were basically incarcerated at the Salpetriere asylum um, in paris among many other places um, the Salpetria interested me because of this mountain of photographic documentation that was created there and the act, of represent, the act of representation itself was this very violent and coercive one, and there was no consent. Um, the, the models were very much kind of subject to the camera's gaze, and there's also a lot of writing about ways that they might have resisted, ways that this diagnosis might have even been performative and kind of allowed them to survive or um, it's a really, really fascinating topic to dig into, and I'm happy to provide readings if people are curious later. Um, I just got interested in this idea of taking technology and taking, again, in this case, the tool of the imaging technology, photography, and trying to apply it to madness, which is completely unpicturable, and how that transaction became a really fraught and, and violent and dangerous one. Um, so I started looking at vintage at medical manuals. This was created with, um, it was uh, Dr. Jean-Martin Charcot and Paul Richet, and they held that the 
an attack of hysteria had these very distinct phases. And the text is probably too small, but the names are incredible. Um, it's, it's French, but there's the period of epi the epileptoid period, the period of clownism, the period of passionate attitudes, and the period of delirium. And this was basically a choreography that they had come up with for this attack of madness. And they would do things like administer electric shocks, hypnosis, there was a horrible device they had called an ovarian compressor. Um, God, I feel like some of this actually probably needs a trigger warning, actually, this material is like very upsetting. Um, but they would get the women to perform. And so I became interested in restaging this. I worked with dancers and some of it is myself as well. Um, I had had a long experience of being as a patient, the subject of a kind of medical gaze. And so it's a really interesting shift of power to be the subject but also to be using that tool on yourself um, and I started making sculptures that just re reenacted those poses basically and titling them after the poses too and these are fairly small these are kind of tabletop size they're about I was thinking the type of thing you might find in a doctor's study you know a medical model scale um, this is from 2014 these were installed in the last show at IBEAM in Chelsea it was called New Romantics and then after that, I also, and some of these decisions I make in my practice are kind of harder to rationalize and harder to explain. I got fascinated by these types of structures, which for people who have worked with 3D printing, again, you probably recognize as the, the support strut and it's designed to hold up a fragile 3D print, a plastic print as it's curing. Um, but for me, I guess this idea of support of the body being enmeshed in this weird kind of machinery, um, this architecture and the implication of a really massive monumental female body um, was really, really intriguing to me. And so I went, I tried so many different programs and so many different configurations and tried to get STLs out of proprietary things. And it was a nightmare, but I did finally crack it. Um, and so I actually made some of these into life-size life size works. And this was the piece that was at the Bitforms exhibition in October 2018. And this is life-size. So this is um, a dancer that I was working with during a residency in Chicago, um, reenacting one of those poses. So I always like to show the making of this, this piece because it was such a ridiculous feat. Um, it's my very long suffering fabricator here. And we have the world's worst jigsaw puzzle. We're trying to put this thing together. And it was a whole week of work for two of us with files and laptops and printouts and numbers. Um, but we did get it together in the end. And then it also became really important to me to hand paint these. So mm -hmm. it felt important to kind of humanize this really chilly digital object. And so like for a long time, I just had my works be, you know, some of the default material that came out of the printer. And that really just started to feel like not the right choice. Um, it's interesting too, I think, for people who work solely in digital. Um, and I, I have mixed feelings about this. Probably everybody has different diff a different way they handle it. But I was really wanting to show sculpture and I was wanting to show work to an audience that wasn't always very familiar with how things that I had made were made. Um, and to me, the hand painting became a little bridge. It became a way for people to understand what decisions I had made, you know, otherwise they had a very hard time with that question. Um, and so instead of, you know, I sort of first felt conflicted about that. And then I began to feel that it was sort of a form of generosity to kind of lead people and show them where your hand had been what choices you had made and with that object and I also after so long of just years of staring at a screen and working with a mouse it was a real joy to hand paint as well um, so my work became more and more material you know more and more kind of messy and um, more I was really aiming towards them you know humanizing more and more actually um, so this was, these are a few more works from that same series. And this is from my exhibition at C24. It was called Transfigured a couple of years back. And also I would make, I often will exhibit these with these renders, which are created in Maya. And the idea is that it's kind of a blueprint. Um, and again, the idea of an architectural tool applied to the body why would you create a blueprint for a female body? You know, the implication that the body is something of a site of construction, um, that it's being 
conserved, that it's being demolished, that it's something that's constantly in process, but again, felt really relevant too in the ways that we think about our bodies, um, particularly, you know, in this, in this decade, this century. So the next thing that I moved on to, and this work was very much interrupted by, um, by the pandemic, was I started researching Bhutto, which is, one sec, Eva, honey, please. Thank you. Um, it's a form of uh, post-war post experimental dance that originated in Japan post-war and is now pretty global and has many offshoots in, in many, many different countries. Um, and it fascinated me. I, I'd been working with dancers throughout the hysteria work and started to get to know more performers and more performance artists. And particularly for me, there was an inversion in... Uh, Buto of um, the idea of the kind of beauty and perfection of the body and so much of it was about you know the theories would have it that it's about the trauma post Hiroshima but there you know there are many other ways to think about it too but so many of the performers really highlight the illness the weakness of the body some of the most compelling performances I'd seen were given by performers in their 70s and 80s um, it was very much about the body being subject to gravity and it's not this amazing, you know, gravity defying, like perfect um, young body, idealized body. It, it felt like the, the opposite to me. And I enrolled, um, I, I was given a, a tech residency at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn um, about, this was two years ago. So this work has been, I'm always very slow in these series. Um, and I brought in a number of Brito performers and so thinking about that idea of gravity and the body and weight and thinking in particular about this idea of the fall, because there is a Bhutto training at the body where the farm, one of the um, main practitioners had established where they would just instruct people to fall for hours and hours. And so I would scan, I scanned these performances basically as they fell or they staged a fall, um, kind of pretending because uh, there's a lot of ways you can hide things in a scanner. You can use black cloth, you can use any kind of dark prop that the scanner won't read if it's if it doesn't have the reflectivity of human skin. Um, so then I would invert them. And so the idea was for the final figures to be kind of floating. Um, and the work a series isn't really about Buto anymore. I just worked with these people in particular because the kind of the gesture and the expression and the kind of intensity that they had was just perfect for what I was trying to do. And in this performance, I was actually scanning the dancers and projecting the, um, the imagery up on a screen, which is what you saw in the first video that I showed in the presentation. Um, so this led to, again, I'll start, I usually start off making prints. This is a very, very large print. So this is, I wanna say like 70 inches or so, um, and almost this kind of scroll format. And then I started making a bar relief and the ultimate goal for these would be to actually be a cast glass. This is, this is an image of, um, uh, it's called cameo glass, one of the most famous examples of cameo glass. So this weird hybrid between 2D and 3D in the, in the sculptural. And then I also, again, went back to the really corny funeral monuments, um, you know, the, the kind of tackiness and hysteria and over the top emotionality of that just kept, kept pulling me back as well as I thought about the aesthetic references for this series. And they, I learned ZBrush too, the like the last two weeks of peace and quiet that I had <laughs> in like the past two years were a two week residency at the studios at Mass Mocha in January, 2020. And I learned, I just did like very little except learn ZBrush, which is digital sculpting software where you can really push and pull the body and change the form, move the arms, move the limbs and pose. And that was never something that I either, I had the skill to do before either. So that was really exciting for this. Um, it's a very long story with this exhibition of mine. It's up at the moment. It's not open uh, to anybody. We really just took photos. It's in New York. Um, this show was meant to open in March 2020 and didn't. And the work got stuck for months and months in this weird COVID time capsule in the gallery. Like when the curator went back a few months ago, she said, like, there are empty coffee cups in there that are seven months old. And it's really weird. <laughs> it's like all the tools were there, all the paint was there. Um, so I sort of dusted it off and I did this very scaled down physical iteration of the show. It was, it's presented by um, 
SVA curatorial practices, the curatorial studies department, and it was meant to be in Chelsea. And um, this is not in Chelsea. This is in another space they have in the Pfizer building in Brooklyn. So this show is really not the way that I intended it to be. Um, they are mostly inkjet prints of the dancers and I'd wanted to make large reliefs and large sculpture. Um, but I actually had, uh, um, I'll just go back to this for a moment. Um, I was ready to let the whole thing kind of sink quietly. And then I was speaking with my old advisor from grad school, Claudia Hart, who is a really great artist to look at. Um, Carla, I don't know if you've shown her work or talked about her, but um, she's great. And her name has come up. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a relevant three, a 4D person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I haven't shown her work. And I don't, I, I actually, I, I don't know a lot about her work. I should introduce her to you. She's fantastic. She's a great speaker as well, but she's been a long-term mentor and, and friend now. And she said to me, you should just build this show in Mozilla Hubs. You know, you, you, she's like, this is, this work needs to be seen and you're being silly. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know about you, but it was a rough year last year. I was really not in a place where I sort of felt ready to show very much. And um, I just spent, to be completely honest, I spent a year like grieving the fact that I couldn't make physical work, the fact that I had to move out of, I was, had this gorgeous studio at the Elizabeth Foundation in Times Square. I had to move out. I had no childcare. We went to Australia. It was this whole, whole thing. Um, and I just didn't, had sort of zero confidence in my work at this point. But she said, like, you need to do this because people are looking at this stuff and this would be a way for you to show your, some of your work the way that you kind of you want it to be seen um, so I that was I, I needed that push it was it was really valuable it was sort of what I needed to hear at the time um, so this is just like a couple of little maquettes from the show these are 3d printed uh, clear 3d print actually on granite so again a kind of tombstone sense um, but what we ended up doing um, and I'm afraid I'm about two weeks away from actually having really good visuals to show. Um, but we did recreate this space in Mozilla Hubs. Um, I was working working with a really great modeler, actually, because I don't have the time right now with the homeschool situation to be learning hubs. Um, but we designed together, first we rebuilt the real gallery, which is this pretty mundane kind of, you know, office space with these pipes. And then we added... Um, three more imaginary rooms that are really become grander and grander and the work gets larger and larger as you move through. So I might also have a, these are the actual 2D inkjet prints, but these in the, the virtual gallery are realized as full sculpture and they, the scale becomes more and more monumental. So I apologize for the timing. It's so close to being able to show. Um, and I can certainly send Carla all the details once it launches. Here's a very basic, it's come a long way since then. Actually, this is one of our first kind of like Maya, um, Maya creations, but you can just see like here that the little gallery starts out at, at one to one scale and then things get larger. And this is a very, very grainy preview that I just got of one of the rooms in the, um, the, digital, the digital space. So um, that's been fun. And then since then I've started working with a, a curator who does mostly VR and I have a group show also that will be opening via um, Meet Museum in Milan on it's opening on the 18th and I'm doing a live stream scanning performance in one of the rooms there um, and then I have a few other online things that are happening as well so it's I'm it's I'm not considering it I don't think of myself as as a kind of XR artist necessarily for me it's a way to um, experience my sculptural work in um you know, maybe like a really great visualization tool. But having said that, I've been having a lot of fun thinking about the limits of this medium. Um, and we've done a whole lot of really slightly tongue in cheek things. Like I didn't want to make the museum incredibly grand with big marble sculptures because that felt like a monument to ego in a little bit. So we've made it like this strange office building that's kind of mutated and morphed and, and grown very large and has these like office paneled ceilings and um, pipes and light switches. And then we've put, there's a very large monumental sculpture at the end and we've put that hanging on strings, even though it's in VR, it doesn't need strings, it doesn't weigh anything, but um, it, all these funny little like meta touches that I've been enjoying thinking about. So it's been a really nice boost. Um, here, I can kind of stop there now. 
Um, having said that, I'm still dying to get back to making real things and people being able to see them. Um, but at least for now, I feel like I'm trying to accept reality and kind of work with what we have. So yeah, that's, that's how are we doing for time? Yeah, that was about 40 minutes. That kind of brings mm -hmm. me up to date, but I'd love to hear any questions. I'm super happy to answer anything that people might be curious about. Yeah, that was uh, phenomenal and it's been great. Oh, and I'm so happy to hear about the latest work and, and the pushing yeah, through because yeah, I think I think a lot of the people in our community as well or, you know, everyone I think in every community is struggling with all mm -hmm. aspects of the pandemic. But there are there are certain issues and complications particular to artists. Um, yeah. I'm going to stop the recording just so that everybody feels a little bit freer with the Q&A.